Okay. Well, anyway, Bo is awesome. Uh, for all the people who missed, right? So, uh, so I've gotten to know him as a super passionate teacher, and of course, a colleague. And I think one of the colleagues I would ever, I was always count on was as someone who would never say not my problem. Um, and so he's super passionate and excited. So I'm really looking forward to listening to his talk on where information and incentives fly. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah. So. Um, yeah, I'm excited to get to talk to you about some of the work that's going on um, in our algorithmic economics group, uh, which kind of sits inside the theory group. Um, so what that means is we try to take problems in the world or in computer science and understand them through math. Now, don't worry. Um, I know what they say, but math isn't hard. They say math is like scary and complicated. But actually, in my experience, it's the real world that's scary and complicated. And I want to start with an example. So if you think math problems are hard, try to solve this problem. Get a group of people in your lab to agree on where to go to lunch. It's a difficult problem. <laughs> now, why is this hard? It's not that the mathematics of the problem are hard. Like, it's a constraint satisfaction algorithm problem, but that's pretty easy to solve. But gathering the information you need and actually getting it together and navigating people's preferences and constraints and the, uh, maybe any strategic behavior involved in uh, choosing a lunch spot, that's what makes this problem difficult. And when you combine it with the constraint satisfaction algorithmic problem, that's where it gets interesting. Let's think of a little bit more of a high stakes example. So imagine that you want to design a new computer science building, just to pick an example. So sure, there's interesting math involved in the architecture and material science and efficiency and cost and all that. But if you're saying designing the problem, the computer science building is a hard problem, part of what's making it hard is the societal context, right? So navigating preferences, um, also predicting. So how are we going to use this building, not just next year, but in 10 years, in 30 years? Um, so information, gathering the information you need to make good decisions and navigating preferences, again, is what makes this problem challenging in combination with all the constraints you have to solve. Uh, also, another aspect of this problem that could be challenging is um, how do you incentivize someone who's building a computer science building to do a really good job on all those little pieces we can't even observe, and we won't find out until 30 years later when there's a really big rainstorm, and hopefully the building stays up, <laughs> and hopefully none of our offices leak. So in all these cases, there's this interaction of algorithms with incentives um, and information. So I'm going to talk to you today about some specific uh, projects that are going on um, in our group uh, along these themes. And so in all of them, I'm hoping you'll see this theme of um, the challenge of uh, trying to run maybe an algorithm, maybe it's a very simple decision-making procedure when you have to gather the information you need um, and you have to um, interface with people's preferences and possibly strategic behavior. Okay, so the first one was going to be about contracts. So that'll be similar to this incentivizing the builder, the person making the building. Uh, the second one will be public projects. So that's how do you get a group of people to agree on what to do when you have a set of alternatives. Um, and the third one is going to be matching, for example, matching employers to employees. And we're going to see some uh, newer twists on that classic problem. Okay, uh, so the first project is joint work uh, between myself and my student Manisha Paparetti Gari. Um, so this actually appeared last year at um, the, really I'd say the premier venue um, for economics and computation and work at that interface. Um, and this conference, EC22, is actually hosted right here at CU Boulder. Um, and Manisha may have even given her talk on this in this very room, although it might have also been one of the other ones. So first I wanna start with a problem we talk a lot about in the algorithmic economics group. How do you elicit a prediction of the future? And then I'm gonna come back to this contracts problem. So the setup is an expert makes some prediction, like the chance of sun is 0.7, that's their prediction. And then you get to find out later whether it's sunny or not, and then you can give them a score, or maybe it's like a payment for accuracy. So your score is going to depend on how accurate their prediction is. And you wanna define this, this score. How do you define this scoring rule? So, okay, more accurate predictions, you get higher scores, but exactly how do you do that? so that the agent actually wants to be truthful, so that it's in their best interest to tell you what they actually think the probability is. Well, okay, spoiler, this is a solved problem. 
the solution actually was first proposed in general by John McCarthy, um, you know, father of AI figure. Uh, and many people since then have uh, given variations on this general theorem that I'm presenting here. Um, I even have a version of this myself, which is in submission to a uh, journal of convex analysis. But in general, all these different variations say a scoring rule is proper if it satisfies some math stuff that has to do with convex functions. And I, it, the math stuff won't be important for the rest of the talk. But the key idea is you can take this convex function and actually construct a proper scoring rule from it. And basically, these tangent lines, if someone's predicting 0 0.7, this tangent line is telling you what their score should be if the event does happen, or on the other end of the tangent line, what their score should be if the event does not happen. So all proper scoring rules look like take a different convex function and use the tangent lines. And on the other hand, if you take any convex function and use the tangent lines, that's going to be proper, meaning truthful. Sorry, the word proper here just means that it uh, maximizes expected score to be truthful. So this is known. We knew this for a while. but Manisha and I were looking at a variant or a new variant of this problem where the expert can acquire some information before they predict and that information could help them predict better. Okay, but it might be costly. So they might not wanna to go to the bother of acquiring that information unless they're gonna get a much better score. So how do you design a reward function? What does it even look like? What are the space of things you could do if the expert's going to be acquiring information and then making a better prediction based on what they learned? So that's a question we had on our mind. There were just a couple new papers in that sphere when we started looking at this, this problem. Actually, they weren't even published yet. They were just archived. So we wanted to weigh in on this question. But at the same time, we were also reading papers on this classical contract theory problem from uh, economics. Sometimes it's called a hidden action problem or a moral hazard problem. Economists like their um, terms for things. <laughs> so if you have someone who's, let's say, creating a building for you. They could either maybe work harder or work less hard or shirk off. And when you might not observe whether they worked hard or didn't, you might not observe if they picked the top quality components for everything. You just get some very noisy signal of the quality much later on when it rains you know, 30 years down the line or something. So there's classic uh, work on how do you design these contracts that can sort of base their payments on what happens later on. Um, and also recent algorithmic work um, in this field. So it's, it's kind of active in computer science right now as well, actually. So we're thinking about that problem. And we're wondering, oh, sorry, this is just a depiction of paying off. The contract pays off depending on what happens. And we're thinking this looks a little bit like the prediction problem, but it's definitely different. And we're wondering about what if you even combine these problems? So the final problem we wanted to solve has all these components together. So there's a hidden action and information acquisition going on. So first, the agent can gather some information that's going to help them decide what they do. So for example, they might look at historical forecasts and say, well, it never rains in Boulder, so I don't need to make things too rainproof. Or maybe they realize, OK, sometimes it does. And then they can choose the contract they want to sign from a menu. This menu becomes important. And then they make their hidden action. And then later, we get some information about what happened. So we wanted to try to combine all these ingredients together. And let me just try to show those all together. So we have this classic passive prediction problem where the expert just sits there and says, I think 70% chance of something happening. And we know how to solve that with these convex function proper scoring rules. But on the other end, we had this classic economics hidden action problem where their builder is either working hard or not. And they kind of knew how to solve that with contracts in the classic case. And we're designing this sort of generalization where an expert could acquire information before making a prediction, or even this more general model where they acquire information. Maybe they make a prediction, or maybe they actually make a decision about some work that they're going to do for you or something. OK, so what, what do these solutions have to look like? Do they have to combine aspects of proper scoring rules with aspects of contracts? And how's that going to look? Well, actually, the key, uh, one of the key points we were making and observations that we made early on is actually all of these solutions can be reduced to designing this proper scoring rule for prediction. So I'll try to give you a, 
a taste of why that's true. And hopefully you agree intuitively that actually all of these look like prediction problems under the hood. So why? So a proposition is if you take any solution to these problems, meaning a sort of menu of these contracts that the agent's picking from, uh, if it's truthful, if it's incentive compatible for them to follow the plan that the principal wants, for example, do do your research and then do work hard, that might be one plan. And for example, like condition on the research, do the appropriate building technique for what your research says. If it's incentive compatible in those kinds of ways, you can represent it as just one of these classic proper scoring rules that we've known about since 1950. So in particular, as, as a convex function with these payments. So why, why would that be true? So if we just think about the contracts setting, here's how that proper scoring rule could look. If you predict that the good thing is gonna happen, like there's no, not, no leak in the building for the next 10 years, and the good thing does happen, that's great. So first of all, it's a very accurate prediction. And second of all, the thing we wanted to happen did happen. So we're gonna give you, we're going to design your contracts so you get a really good reward for predicting good things and then making them happen. Right? If you work hard, then the chance of the good thing happening goes up. And if that happens, then the contract will give a really good reward. On the other hand, if you predict a bad thing and the bad thing happens, well, okay, you are accurate, but we're only going to give you a small reward. And then in the other cases, uh, we might give you even smaller rewards because you're not even accurate in your predictions. So the philosophy here, really, again, comes from our forecasting roots, and we kind of brought this to the contracts um, community is you can think of the contracts setting up as just prediction problems where because the agent wants to predict really accurately and in particular they want to predict good things really accurately they're motivated to work hard and work hard on let's say building the building so that it doesn't leak so if i set up this prediction based contract and i say if you predict no leaks and then you make your building and it doesn't leak that's when I'm gonna give you the really high payoff. Then just because they want their prediction to come true, they're going to work hard. So that, that's the intuition behind this result. Mathematically, we kind of just could draw a bunch of lines and, and observe that we had a convex function. So the math kind of translates to an intuition that maybe people weren't thinking about contracts in that way necessarily. Um, and then we had a few more results that were a bit more algorithmic around this setting. So I talked about this idea of a plan that the that we as a principal want to incentivize this agent to follow. So for example, the plan is, you know, do the research and then condition on the research. If you find this, you should work hard in this way. If you find this, you should use these materials. So given any such target plan, we can uh, construct a scoring rule in polynomial time that will be optimal, meaning it will spend the least amount in expectation that you can possibly spend while still incentivizing the agent to follow the plan. So that was kind of the main technical result that appeared in that paper. Um, and we also found a little bit more. So I mentioned the special case is this information acquisition problem where the principal goes out and does a bunch of research and then they just use that to make a good prediction. So in that problem, there's no action like work hard or don't work lazily. It's just make a good prediction. That's actually a special case um, of the general problem. And we found a closed form solution there, which as I mentioned, there's, there were a few papers out there, but there hadn't been a closed form for this uh, kind of problem yet in the literature. Uh, and it actually, we could show that it looks like an inverted pyramid. So I talked about the convex function. So um, in general, in the pictures I showed you, it will look like this V. And we gave this general multi-dimensional solution that looks like a pyramid for the case where uh, there aren't just two possible outcomes like leaky roof, no leaky roof, but many possible outcomes, maybe like good, pretty good, and so on. So then you have a high dimensional problem and we have a, a closed form for that. Okay. Um, but I think that's, that's all of the results that I wanna cover. Um, you know, we have a bit more kind of relating our perspective to classical contract theory, um, but that's, that's the key results that I wanna cover. So I'll give you a few takeaways and then I'll pause if there are any clarifying questions before we go to the next one. So, uh, again, one thing I like about this uh, project was the math looks like this, but the qualitative interpretations, I think, are, are very interesting and not necessarily how people are thinking about contract theory all the time. So 
this idea that the distinction between an action you take, like working hard or not working hard, the distinction between that and a prediction you're making about what you think is going to happen is maybe not so important. It's not um, when we're thinking about how to design contracts, we can really think about it all as predictions if we want. At least we're claiming that. Um, another really interesting thing going on here that's a theme in other work in our group, this idea of value of information. Right? So how do we incentivize the person to go out there and gather this costly information that will tell them how to do a good job? So to do that, you have to design your rewards so that if they gather useful information and make use of it, they're going to get much higher payoffs than if they just try to guess and they try to do their best without gathering information. And so, for example, you know, if running a market research survey or a meteorological survey or so on is a very costly thing to do, the builder might just skip it and try to do their best and build the building. So you need to design these incentives such that that information is valuable to them and as it is uh, valuable to your problem of designing a good building. So all these components are coming together. I didn't give you a much depth of insight you know, into how they all play together, but I hope you got a flavor of uh, the ideas of what are going on there. Um, a little bit of the math and a little bit of the qualitative points we're trying to make with it. Okay, so I, I don't wanna take too many like high level questions, so, but any clarification questions. And then at the end, I will be very glad to take high level questions when we have time. I'm just easy to get sidetracked, so. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, that was the first of three projects that I wanted to tell you about. The second one is this public projects problem. Um, and this is joint work with Mary Monroe. Um, and this is still in progress work. Um, so we got a grant last year from uh, the Ethereum Foundation. Well, I guess I should mention. So this is actually a blockchain group. They, they run one of the biggest blockchains. And some people in the blockchain community are very, very interested in how do groups of people organize, right? So how do you organize people to make good decisions for the group when everyone has possibly conflicting interests and values and so on? And some of that goes back to basic problems that people have thought about and studied for many decades, even centuries. And the public projects problem is, is one of those. Um, so a bunch of people want to decide what to do together. So for example, let's say we have a little space in our new building that we're going to design. And we're trying to decide, should we put in uh, a kitchenette, as denoted by coffee cup? <laughs> I, you, you could tell that was a coffee cup, right? Or <laughs> uh, it's a paper coffee cup without the, or, <laughs> or we could put in a record. OK, so as denoted, of course, by the ping pong kettle and ping pong ball. So we can either put in a kitchenette or a record. And we need to decide. And it's, it's this is actually, this is a really hard problem. So um, you could take a vote, but you could have a lot of people voting who actually don't even go to that end of the building ever and don't actually even care. Whereas the people who are actually in that end of the building might have some other really strong preference. Um, and anything you do besides a vote could seem unfair. So it's not easy to solve these kinds of problems. Um, so, Here's one mathematical model of um, how economists can think about the problem. So we could think that each person in their head has a value for each alternative. So uh, for example, this person cares pretty strongly that it's a kitchenette, but they don't really like the rec room. It'd be somewhat useful to them, but not really, and so on. Uh, so to make progress, we often will assume that the value is in units of money. So this is sort of equivalent to the amount of money this person would be willing to part with in exchange for getting the kitchenette. Like if they were the dictator and they just had to pay this much to get a kitchenette installed, that's how we measure sort of the, the preference in their head. Now, this is already somewhat of an assumption, but it lets us make some progress by comparing these across each other. Um, actually, it doesn't have to be money. So um, you can do things like voting with play money. So you can issue each person some amount of play money and then they can contribute to decisions by sort of using that money in, in these mechanisms that we're about to talk about. Um, uh, yeah, and, and so on. And if you think about like the blockchain world, they can issue, for example, everyone who's part of an organization, like the CU theory group, 
you could issue some tokens on the chain and it can, you can use those tokens to vote. So it doesn't have to be money. Um, but the goal is always to maximize what we like to call with a bit of grandiosity, the social <laughs> welfare of the problem. But here that's just as designed, defined to be the total value. So you could argue that we should add up these columns and if the blue total is higher, we should build the kitchenette. And if the red total is higher, we should build the rec room. Okay, so our goal is to pick whichever one has a higher social wealth. Okay. So there's a lot of assumptions and sort of values baked into this formula, formalization of the problem, but it's a very interesting formalization to solve. And if we solve it, maybe it will help people figure out how to coordinate groups if those values are compatible with the setting that they're in, which, which is an important question. So there existing, there's, there's kind of this classical solution that works, but it, it just isn't practical and people don't like it. I'm not gonna tell you much about how it works, um, but this solution is sort of weird because it will maximize welfare. It'll pick the right alternative and it'll charge people payments, or we can think of these tokens or play money if we want. But it's very fragile, it turns out, um, and it's very unpredictable. So the very strange things happen in this mechanism and I, I don't want to spend time to explain, but often nobody has to pay anything and we just pick the rec room. And then all the kitchenette people feel a little bit miffed. They're like, I would have paid some of my tokens or some of my money to get the kitchenette built and you're just going to give them the rec room for free in a sense. Like, are you going to, they're, it's sort of not going to cost them any of their governance tokens to build the rec room. That doesn't seem fair. Um, and then on the other hand, you can have kind of opposite things happen where all of a sudden, everybody who wanted the rec room has to pay a whole lot, and there's all these extra tokens that get uh, paid. Unpredictable. So there's this proposal recently called quadratic voting uh, that takes a very different approach. And this proposal for public projects, which comes from a, a white paper published last year, sort of jumps off quadratic voting to propose a totally different style of mechanism, and it's one we really liked and wanted to study. So here's how it works. And then I'll tell you what they did and I'll tell you what we did on top. So each person is gonna cast some votes for and against each option. So you can actually cast a few votes in favor of the rec room. And you can even use some of your tokens to cast votes against the kitchenette. Okay. And then the number of tokens or dollars that you're going to pay in order to cast those votes is going to be the square of the votes on each alternative added up. So if I put 10 tokens on, 10 votes on the rec room, that'll cost me 100. And if I put five tokens against the kitchenette, that'll cost me 25 for a total of 125. Well, and then there's this parameter C that becomes important. So you'll pay C times 125. So if we make C really small, um, then each vote costs relatively little. If we make C really large, each vote costs a lot. But there's some interesting dynamics here because of the squared. Um, so we actually had proposed in our proposal to the Ethereum Foundation this exact mechanism, but we didn't have the squared. And it turns out the squared is really, really interesting um, for math reasons that I won't have a lot of time to get into. But their proposal also does this, which is a bit odd. Instead of just picking the thing with the most votes, we're going to use what's called the softmax function. And this actually comes up a lot in machine learning. So the probability that we pick, let's say the rec room, is gonna be proportional to E raised to the power of votes for the rec room. And the probability we pick the kitchenette is gonna be proportional to E to the votes to the kitchenette. And what this does is kind of, it softens out the decision boundary. So if there are many more votes for the rec room than kitchenette, then this probability is gonna be very close to one for the rec room. And it's basically like you're deterministically saying, everyone liked the rec room better, there's a lot more votes for it, we're going with the rec room. But if it's very even, so if the votes are about the same, this probability will get to about 50-50, and you could argue in some sense that's even more fair, where if the votes are about equal, we end up flipping the coin. Okay, people don't usually like to make decisions about their lives by flipping coins, but in theory and computer science and machine learning, we like it a lot. It turns out to have a lot of really nice stability properties for this mechanism. And we actually proposed this too, but again, we didn't have the idea of the squared. Once we saw the squared, we realized there was some cool stuff happening. So here's what they showed. 
if, so basically a whole bunch of conditions mean this mechanism is good asymptotically. So what are these conditions? Well, the people participating kind of have to be IID. They have to draw their preferences from the same distribution independently. Uh, the values that they have for the outcomes have to be bounded. So they have to all sort of be small participants in a very large sea of people. Um, and then they're looking at the solution concept called equilibrium, Bayes-Nash equilibrium, and in particular symmetric. So equilibrium is something we study a lot in game theory. It's a situation where everybody is optimally playing given what everyone else is doing. So the situation is in balance, equilibrium. So everybody is optimizing or best responding at the same time. That's an equilibrium. Normally in games, we propose that as our prediction of what will happen. If you deploy this mechanism, in the long run, people should hopefully play in equilibrium. That's a whole assumption. But uh, to get anywhere with math, we either have to study that or propose something else. And anything else means it seems to be worse. So that's OK. But this symmetric part is also an important assumption that they're making in this work, which is sort of that everyone is playing with the same kind of plan. So basically, all the people whose preferences are one way are, play, are voting in the same way, and everyone whose preferences are in another way are voting in the same way. So everyone, yeah, so everybody is sort of acting in the same way given their preferences. You might think that's reasonable, or you might not. Also, it is an asymptotic statement. So as the number of participants goes to infinity, we can say that the probability we're making the right decision approaches one, which is it's a great statement, but we could ask for a lot more. So our goal when we were looking at this results was to say, can we move this a bit closer to understanding the practicality of this mechanism? So this theorem says this isn't a crazy thing to do, at least from this perspective of it has some guarantee that asymptotically good stuff happens. OK, good stuff eventually happens. But can we, can we ask, like, is this going to be a reasonable thing to do uh, at a low level? So work in progress, notwithstanding, by the way, anything I said at the beginning of this talk, sometimes math is hard. <laughs> but we did our best. So we've got some results so far and uh, some exciting directions to go. So. In this classic case of two choices, we just need to decide rec room, kitchenette. In any equilibrium, and I'll mention pure strategy, uh, the social welfare of the mechanism that it generates compared to choosing the optimal choice, that ratio is getting very close to one as certain things happen. So one minus something that's hopefully very small. And if you look at this, you can see that it's actually quantifying some of the things that are happening in the previous result in a much more fine-grained way. So we can say when uh, the mechanism is going to work well, even with few participants. So one thing that's happening, we don't necessarily need participants to be bounded, but I'm going to come back to that a bit. As long as the total welfare, this capital U1 is the total welfare of outcome one, like the kitchenette. As long as that's much higher than the total welfare of the second best, like the rec room, if that gap is really big, this whole number is small and the social welfare is very close to one. So you can see qualitatively from uh, this theorem that if there's a big gap between what people truly prefer, U1 minus U2 is large, then in an equilibrium, the chances that you're, the chances that you're going to pick the good one are very high. They're very close to one. Well, yeah, the total social welfare is close to one, which does imply that. Uh, there's also this parameter C I talked about. And it looks like if we just make C really small, then we can also achieve this. So we can also achieve that the social welfare is very close to one. Well, OK, so back to pure strategy equilibrium. What that means is a, place, a case where people are deterministically choosing what to do. They're not going to pick their votes randomly. It's pretty weird if you have a game where people, like a voting game where people are voting randomly. It makes a lot more sense to think of a solution concept where people look at their preferences and just decide what to vote. Okay, but we can show a pure strategy equilibrium is only guaranteed to exist if C is a little bit large. It's larger than anybody's, any individual's preference. 
any individual's maximum preference. So what you can actually see is happening is we need to set C somewhat large. And in this theorem, you're seeing the ratio of people being small compared to the overall. So if the overall preferences are really large in the denominator and people's individually are very small compared to the group, that's gonna go in the numerator. And so you can see these kind of qualitative statements from the previous work playing out much more as, um, non-asymptotically, much more concretely. Okay, and we have simulations results which show this actually breaks down if you try to set your parameter C too small, you get mixed strategy equilibrium, which are very weird and probably hard to believe that people would really do that. Okay, um, so I think I have time to tell you a little bit about, I'm, I'm not really going to give you intuition for why the proof is true, but just a sense of what we're doing when we try to prove this kind of stuff. Um, that will make it a lot less mysterious, I hope. So one thing we're doing is we're trying to show the utility function is concave as a function of your votes. This turns out to be really nice um, if you can show that. So to do that, we have to analyze the second derivatives and the Hessian matrix. And if we can show it's positive semi-definite, then this utility function is concave. So that's one thing that's happening. And that's where we get this bound on the parameter C. If you choose C properly, then everybody's utility is nice and concave. Uh, then we can use a fixed point theorem for concave utilities, whatever that means, to get that a pure strategy equilibrium actually exists. If lots of functions are concave and people are optimizing them at the same time, you could kind of believe that there's an optimal point for all of them that's simultaneously optimal. And you mean negative yes. Okay. So we need the Hessian to be negative semi-definite for the function to be concave. Thank you. <laughs> Not positive semi-definite. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, good, yeah. So um, then we can get existence of pure strategy equilibrium that way. And then to, to get this top result, the social welfare result, um, for a lot of reasons, it turns out to boil down in a lot of the analysis to analyzing the properties of this function. And we can kind of show that if the total welfare of one alternative is higher than the other, then if you plug that into this function, x e to the minus x, you get something higher. Uh, well, maybe. So before one, when, thing, when the values are one or less, this function is monotone, and what I said is definitely true. Unfortunately, when some of the um, values get higher than one, the thing I said is not necessarily true. So you could have a smaller number of votes or welfare that has a higher function value than something that more votes or welfare. So we're doing a lot of analysis to actually show those things don't happen um, because this function ends up uh, controlling uh, how many votes each alternative gets. All right. So I know that explanation didn't make sense to what we're actually doing, but it's a flavor of the kind of math that's happening. I thought it might be fun to see. Okay, uh, I think, yeah, a little bit more on our results and where we're trying to go. So what, that was two alternatives, rec room, kitchenette. What if you have M alternatives and you're trying to vote between M alternatives? Well, we have the same theorem with some function F here, but it ain't pretty. Um, and it's not where we want to end up because there's actually this very poor dependence on like C and the gaps. So before we had this nice dependence on the gap between the most preferred alternative and everything else. But the dependence here is sort of like exponential in a bad way. So we think we can do a lot better, um, but at least we have some quantitative bounds to start with. Um, and so we have some conjectures uh, about what we might find going forward. So one of them could be if everyone's pretty much aligned on what the alternatives look like, like everyone agrees the rec room is the best and the kitchenette's you know, second best. We conjecture that in those cases, this pure strategy equilibrium always exists. So far in our simulations, that seems like it could be true. And that would have some interesting implications. You, you would kind of hope that any mechanism for voting would make the right decision in this setting. So we should check if this mechanism is good when we're in this easy setting. And then we have some conjectures about when people randomize. Okay, um, but just like the previous one, I should make sure to keep going. Um, 
after exploring more about the limits of the mechanism, we want to actually connect it to this idea of predicting what's going to happen. So, for example, uh, if you can predict that the number of grad students that are going to be in the department is going to grow at this rate, that might affect whether you think the rec room is a good idea or the kitchenette is a good idea. Or if you can predict that we're going to need more space for lectures or maybe that we're going to use less, that prediction can help you make better decisions today. And we'd love to tie these prediction ideas into the decision-making ideas today. So that's something we're thinking about for this project. Okay, I hope that we still have a little bit of math energy left for a very exciting topic for us in computer science, as well as in economics, matching. Um, so this is joint work with Robin Bowers. Um, it was just uh, accepted to the Conference on Web and Internet Economics. Uh, and we also recently received a grant um, from the NSF uh, to pursue future lines of work in this um, area. Okay, so matching is an awesome pro problem. Uh, for example, you might be matching workers on one side of this graph to jobs on the other. So you need to make this one-to-one -one matching, which workers do which jobs. Now, there are a few paradigms of how you could approach this. A classic one is stable matching. Uh, I'm going to mention that at the end, but we're thinking about a more quantitative um, approach, which is to maximize the total value of the matching. Right? So you could imagine that for each worker, let's say this one, their value for this being matched to this, this job is pretty low. They're not super excited about it, but being matched to this job is very high. On the other hand, you can imagine this person had this employer has some value for this worker and some value for this worker, which is a little bit higher. So this worker might be a better fit for the job or they have some qualifications that's a little bit better, but they're not, uh, they don't have a strong preference in this case. And so if we can maximize the total value of the matching, that could by some measure be a good overall outcome for everybody, at least in aggregate. So it's a different paradigm for what you wanna do. Um, and of course, that's really getting back to the same measure of social welfare. So if you think of all these values, we wanna maximize the total value. Okay, but there's a problem which makes this hard in real life, going back to my introduction, for example. So often in settings like this, we don't actually know what we want. Okay, so we don't even know what all the employers out there are. We might not know what it's like to work at that company. Will I actually enjoy it? What are even the benefits or what a you know, vacation and stuff? I don't know. So to find that out, I have to do work. I have to spend time and effort and energy just to figure out whether I might like a job or not. And the employer has to do a lot of work to figure out if an employee could be a good match or not. And it's, it's, this information is very important. You know, they can read the resume, but they might have to do interviews. They really need that information and they're gonna put in a lot of effort to find it out. So, a model of the problem ideally would incorporate the idea of spending time and effort. So if you maximize the value of the match, but the way you do that is everyone has to read 3,000 resumes and conduct 1,500 interviews for every single employer job, and every worker has to go on tons of interviews and so on, the value you created is not necessarily very high. So what we'd like, and this is really getting to be like an algorithmic problem, is to decide how much do we need to invest in finding out information and how much do we just use that information to make good decisions or the best decisions we can under the uncertainty that we have. So one way to model this and the way that we've used is you can think of each box here as having a distribution of values that it might turn out to be, probability distribution. Uh, and there's some cost that you have to invest to find out what the what your value is, for example, for this employer. Now, you could definitely make this more complex, and actually we have. Um, so you could think about stages of inspection, where first you, um, you know, read the resume, and then you set up the interview, and then you do the second round interview. But okay, for today, just uh, one round of sort of spending the cost and finding out the information you need. Uh, okay, so to solve the problem of matching people to people, which is super difficult. We wanna start by thinking about simpler versions of the problem. Well, luckily some prior work has already done that. So we can think about matching people to items. 
Okay, so this is going to be a lot simpler because the preferences and strategy is only on one side. So something like we have a bunch of items we want to give away. We might run an auction so that people who really want the items are the ones who, who get them. Okay, let's make it simpler though. What about selling a single item, which as you all can see is a cookie, of course. Um, what about that? What about that in the case where people don't actually know their value until they like come into the bakery and like smell the aroma of the cookie and you know decide, look at the you know bake and so on. So this is an algorithmic problem. You have a bunch of possible people you could give it to, but to find out how much they want it, you have to investigate one by one and somehow stop and choose someone to give the cookie to. So that's a non-trivial algorithmic problem, even if nobody's being strategic, even if you know everything. And it was solved in 1979 by Weitzman. He called it the Pandora's box problem. It's actually a special case of the Gittins index theorem for multi-armed bandits, which some of us remember from way back when. Um, some of us remember from reading about way back when. Anyway, um, so Weitzman showed there's, in this case, there's a very simple and optimal descending policy. So you compute an index for each alternative. There's this formula for computing it that kind of depends on the cost and the distribution. And then you go from the highest down. And this index kind of represents the potential upside if you, for, for looking at that alternative in more detail, for inspecting it. So in this case, we have all these alternatives, and maybe this one is the highest index. And Weitzman said, OK, what you do is you go to the one with the highest index, and you open it, and you inspect it first. OK, and maybe you find out that the value is 10.6. You say, well, there's something with a higher index than that. So I'm not going to stop and give it to this person until I look at the index that's higher than 10.6. So maybe you do that. Oh, they have a really high value, 17.3. And maybe none of the other indices are any higher than this. That's the point, he said, where you can stop. And it's best to just give it to the person with this high value. And don't spend any more resources trying to inspect the other alternatives because their indices are too low. And for a lot of interesting math reasons, this is actually optimal. It's, it's, very, it's um, very counterintuitive how you actually prove that this is the best possible algorithm. There is some very cool stuff happening um, in those proofs, but this is the best you can do. OK, now what happens when we take that to, so this is the match happening. When we take that to a world where people are strategic, we have to coordinate selfish strategic behavior so let's still think about selling a single item, and let's hope that that will get us back to matching soon. So people are, aren't going to listen if you say, well, you shouldn't be inspecting yet. You need to wait till later, like this person needs to inspect. We want a mechanism that coordinates that behavior as if they were all running the optimal algorithm together, even though they have their own preferences. Well, or uh, approximately so. And so we did this. So I was fortunate to be on this paper uh, toward the end of my PhD, where we applied this model to this auction problem. And the idea was to mimic this optimal policy by running an auction with a descending price. So the way that works is the auctioneer stands up there with this glorious, tasty cookie and says, all right, do I hear, you can think, if you prefer, you can think about like selling a house, right? Do I hear 1.5? Do I hear 1.4? Do I hear 1.3? And then someone says, yes, 1.3. And at that point, it's sold. So that's how the descending price auction works. Very different than this ascending one where people can stay in, they have to stay in, and then eventually they drop out if they don't think they, the price gets too high. And this difference between, turns out to be really important. So we can show that this descending price auction gives us this constant factor approximation to social welfare when people are playing in equilibrium, et cetera. So it's not optimal. Actually, in simulations, it's very close, um, but it's at least one half optimal, or actually the factor is a bit better. And I, that might sound OK or not OK. In theory, that's a good result. <laughs> in, contrast, in contrast, we can show if you do the ascending price auction, you can't get any constant factor. Because basically what's going to happen is, if you think about a house, um, buying a house, you have to decide to spend a lot of energy to go to the open house, right? So in an ascending auction, you're staying in the auction, which means at any moment, everyone else might drop out and stick you with the house. Well, 
if you're at risk of being stuck with the house, maybe you better go check it out and make sure you actually want it. But so you have to decide to either in, investigate this house really early and spend all these resources or just drop out of the auction and find out later that the house sold for something very reasonable and you wish you'd stayed in. So it turns out the ascending type approach is actually incompatible with the algorithm problem of optimal search theory. You really need this descending approach. Well, okay, we're gonna make it, we're good. So can we take this insight into a much more complicated setting? There's not just one cookie, there's a bunch of things on the other side of the market. Also, those things aren't items, they're people and they're employers and employees. Can we take this back to this two-sided? Uh, so yes, so to an extent. The proposed mechanism is, we, so in this previous white paper of mine, we proposed this mechanism called the Marshallian match after this economist, Alfred Marshall, but we didn't know how to analyze it back when we wrote this white paper. It looks like the descending procedure. Everybody's gonna maintain some bid on all of their possible partners on the other side of the match. And there's gonna be a global price that's gonna descend. When the price reaches the total bid on an edge, so how much I'm bidding on this job and how much the employer is bidding on me, if those add up to a high enough number when the price hits it, the mechanism says you are now matched. Okay, so it matches this person to this job. And naturally, of course, we think, you know, the high bids should correspond to high value matches. So that seems like that's a good idea. We'll see. And both sides pay their bids. So, so we set this up as like an auction-like mechanism. And there's some good reasons for that that sort of make these bids um, consequential so that you can't just bid random numbers. You have to actually pay the bid. But we actually have ways to redistribute some of that revenue back. So um, we don't have to make a lot of money running this if we want to redistribute the revenue and just do it for social good, we can, at least to some extent. Oh, okay. So that was the proposal, but we didn't know how to analyze it until Robin came along. Okay, the result, the main theorem was if the values are positive, which seems very reasonable, but we're gonna get back to it, then this Marsh Marshallian match guarantees in any equilibrium, which I've mentioned, the social welfare is a constant factor of optimal which again, I'm claiming in theory is a nice result. Uh, so, and yeah, you can probably improve these constants. Uh, so we're really showing that this descending price, no matter how many people you have, no matter what these distributions and the costs are for inspecting and so on, uh, this thing is going to be compatible with a good allocation and good match. And more than that, like a good algorithmic decision-making process that's spread out among a bunch of people about when do I do my research and when do I sort of invest all this effort into, you know, investigating my options? And it's going to coordinate that behavior into something that's globally approximately optimal, even as the number of people uh, grows arbitrarily large. So as I mentioned, well, this holds for this model with these inspection costs. Uh, actually, it's kind of fun. We can extend this to matchings on hypergraphs. So if you imagine a problem where we need to form groups of size one, two, three, or four, like a group project or something in class, although I don't know if you'd use a monetary mechanism in your class, we can actually do this group formation problems with the same kind of descending procedure. So all four people are bidding on forming this group, and when the price reaches the sum of all four bids, that group is officially formed, whatever that means. Uh, so anyway, that's just kind of a fun extension. And okay, I'm, I don't think I should spend too much time on digging into these, but I'll put them up in a second. So this proof is kind of just putting together a lot of different ideas, as, as you can see. Maybe the one that I'll highlight, well, for one thing, okay, I wanna talk about the interaction of algorithms and incentive problems. So the optimal algorithm for max weight matching, right? don't worry about the Pandora's box or anything. That's already a complicated algorithm. Right, there's this Blossom algorithm we know about. Um, on bipartite graphs, you can do something a little bit simpler, but it's still, you know, it's a complicated algorithm. But the greedy algorithm where you take the largest edge and match it, and now you take the largest remaining edge and match it, the greedy algorithm is a half approximation to the optimal. And if you think about that greedy algorithm, 
that's a kind of descending like algorithm. We, we can think of a descending price that reaches the highest value edge and match it and so on down. So that's part of what's going on. here. Um, on the algorithmic economic side, we're using this framework, which is really, um, I think a triumph of the field of algorithmic game theory. People developed it over five, 10 years, about a decade ago or more. Um, I'll just say there's something really interesting we have to do to invoke that, which is it involves reasoning about counterfactual worlds where someone did something else in the mechanism and everyone else reacted to it. And you can imagine that in a mechanism with two-sided matching, that can get really, really ugly to analyze really fast. One thing we had to do was design the mechanism so that you don't actually see what bids people are placing necessarily, and you don't, you don't see when they're inspecting. And that allowed us to sort of invoke this framework and do this counterfactual analysis. So what we could actually do is say, what if someone changed their strategy from whatever complicated thing they're doing to just being truthful about their preferences and sort of bidding truthfully, and then they inspect actually when that Gittins index tells them to, or that Weitzman Pandora's box index. So we said, what if they did that instead? And then we could analyze what would happen and show that it was still kind of good. And we were able to relate that back to what's actually happening in the mechanism with this, this framework. All right. Um, I know I'm leaving out a lot of details that you would need to actually evaluate you know, what's actually happening there, but hopefully that gives a flavor of what, what the analysis is doing. OK, uh, oh yeah, I said I would mention stability. OK, so I have to tell you about the limitation of our result before I finish and go to the, the outro of the talk. Um, I mentioned positive values. So everyone has to have a positive value. That seems very natural, but actually it's very important if you think about something like workers and jobs. So there, if you think about it after a while, you, you realize the right model is that a worker probably has a negative value for having to do a job and they're not gonna pay for the privilege of doing the job. They wanna get paid to do the job. Okay, grad school notwithstanding. Um, <laughs> so, what actually you want is a mechanism where people, the workers can say, I'm gonna bid a salary of X, you need to pay me X to do this job. And maybe this other job sounds really nice and it has lots of benefits and you would only have to pay me Y. And that's really like a negative bid. So we really want our mechanism. And then instead of paying their bid, they, get, they pay negative X. They're getting paid a salary of X. The mechanism would pay them a salary of X. So that's what you really want. And our theorem doesn't apply to that situation. So we're not done yet. Uh, but we do have a, a result, which is this one for that situation. And it involves this notion of stability, which I don't think we have time to get into. And so I'm gonna skim over it. But the main point is the, this main problem that we wanna solve of matching workers to employers, that's really the problem we wanna solve. It's still open. We're, we've taken a step, but we still have more to do on that problem. Okay, let me close so that uh, we can get some questions. Um, so first, first thing I wanna say in closing is uh, there's a lot of really cool work that I'm very excited about going on in the algorithmic economics and theoretical machine learning group. Um, I mentioned the students I'm working with and I'm uh, working with Professor Raf Frangillo on a lot of this work. We're co-advising most of these students. Um, and I didn't, I didn't get a chance to talk about a lot of that exciting work, especially on the machine learning side. So I wanna uh, give a quick nod to that as well as to the broader theory group. Um, yeah, just a lot of exciting stuff happening. I'm sorry I didn't have a chance to get to it. These are some of those. Um, and I wanted to close by coming back to what I mentioned at the beginning, which is sort of like, how do we think about problems in theory? And I've been thinking a lot about something Rebecca said last week, which was this quote of, would you sign the blueprints, right? So if someone was designing and building the system using your principles, would you sign the blueprints? And I thought, well, I'm not really a blueprints kind of person. I'm more of a <laughs> stick figure kind of person, you may have noticed. And so the way I think about you know, what we, we do in theory is we try to draw stick figures of situations and understand what will happen. So I have an example. <laughs> so the bike with square wheels won't roll very well. If I draw a stick figure with round wheels, it rolls. That doesn't mean that you can build the stick figure with round wheels and it's gonna sell 
because there's a million other things you need to know if you're actually going to be building a bicycle that needs to be safe and reliable um, and you know painted pretty colors and all those things. And there's a million aspects of those situations that I'm not studying. But what I want to do is draw a stick figure of the situation and just understand, does this aspect work? And it's actually really hard to know. So if you think about matching, it seems very natural to do some ascending type approaches. Like, for example, deferred acceptance, which is the classic algorithm for stable matching, has this very ascending flavor. But we can actually say now that if you were in a situation where investigation and acquiring information is a big aspect of your matching problem, and you try to do an ascending type approach, you're actually on square wheels. And it's really not obvious that that's the case. Um, so uh, we really try to boil down these hard problems in the world into math problems. When we solve them, it doesn't mean we know, you know what the solution in the world is going to be, but it does cast some light on what can happen and what the possibilities are. So what I'd like to say is, I'm probably not going to be the one they're asking to sign the blueprints, but whoever it is, I hope they read our papers first. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, Ken, please. I have just one quick question on that word that was in the second one. Yeah. Um, are you assuming that people, when they report their values, they're being truthful? Ah, good. No. Yes. So are we assuming that people are truthful when they, in the public projects problem where we have this squared payment rule? No. So that's what, and, and that's kind of a departure from a lot of classic mechanism design where you try to design something that's truthful and then you can analyze it because people are just being truthful and you can analyze. But recently there's been more interest in these non-truthful things, but then you have to say, what, if they're not truthful, what do they do? And that's where it's tough. Yep. So this is closer to a blueprint question. Sorry. In your first uh, page, you were starting. Uh, fortunately, I got experience with building blueprints. So nobody <laughs> is actually going to tell you in your contract my roof is going to leak or my foundation is going to crack. But what they are going to do is say, I assume I can use a less expensive roofing system, a more expensive one, mm -hmm. or I can assume I'm going to drill. Deeper case on the less expensive. Does your theory apply equally well to the assumption being something different but directly linked to the outcome? Possibly. It's it's going to apply the best when we can boil it down to some future event and we can just condition the contract on if that event happens, you know, this happens, and if not, we pay some other thing. You could try to do this conditional thing. So you could try to sort of boil it down to, well, I'm going to use this material and there's some understanding that this material, we all, all agree it has enough properties. But yeah, it works best with these sort of future events. And it's funny, one of the classic things, conclusions you come to in contracts, like the first thing you say in like day one or two in your econ class is, well, the best solution seems to be to just sell the project to the builder because then they own the building and then they're the ones who have to deal with the leaky roof in 30 years. And the reason that that pops out of the math is because if you can't check down the road and you can't sort of incentivize them for the thing you care about down the road, it's just very, very hard to do those incentives. So some answer to the question. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you mentioned that you put so, so, I mean, it turns out, right, one side does really well in that algorithm, right, the stable marriage algorithm, the other side does really poorly, it's fact. Uh, so, but in your settings, I noticed you start, somehow try to maximize the sum over both sides. So, yeah. so there, there is some symmetry there, right? So can you comment on that? Is that always, I mean, something you want or? Yeah, it's, it's very hard to tell. Um, Blueprint's question. Um, oh. Good. I forgot to plug in before we started, but we're good. Um, yeah, so it depends so much on your setting. Um, I, I would hesitate to say that this mechanism is actually going to be more like egalitarian across everyone, because it could be that, like, for example, if um, Google is one of the employers and they have really, really high values for everyone, 
the mechanism tries to maximize the sum of values by making Google really happy. And that might not be what the workers want. So it's not clear that this social welfare is actually going to be good for everybody. Um, on the other hand, there are arguments that, well, as long as you produce the most value, then you just need to figure out how to redistribute. So if we can charge Google a lot of money for getting its high value matches, then we can kind of bring some of that value out to everybody else if we redistribute the money. But yeah, the, the contrast to this stable matching thing is, is a very interesting one. Another one is we're pretty much assuming we can use money. And in so many situations of matching, that's not a, an assumption people want to um, invoke. So for example, um, matching something like kidney donations to recipients of a, a kidney, um, what economists call repugnance, we, we don't think that's the kind of thing that should have a monetary market. Um, and for doctors to hospitals, you could argue if using sort of money is the right tool. Yeah, so that's the second point I wanted to raise. So you mentioned money, but the utility of money might not be linear. Uh, yeah. Like a millionaire versus a graduate student. <laughs> yeah. $10,000 might be nothing to a millionaire versus, you know, yeah. so might not be a linear utility there, right? So, yeah. But you're assuming it's linear, right? Yeah. So for this social welfare, which I've defined as the sum of the values, for it to really make sense as actually everybody's total utility, you kind of need to assume that everyone's utility for a dollar is the same. Um, basically, like moving a dollar from one person to another doesn't make anyone happier or sadder. And that's across like all of mechanism design pretty much. Um, and it is a it can be a problem and it's something you just have to remember if you're gonna try to take these mechanisms to some particular setting. Now, sometimes like if these things are tokens where we say, look, everybody in the theory lab gets a hundred tokens and we're gonna be voting on where to go to lunch every week, then everyone has the same amount. So maybe that's an okay scenario. Or if you're in a scenario where maybe a bunch of companies are building bidding on a contract like maybe you have a bunch of federal contracts and a bunch of companies and they're bidding on them. You might say, okay, these companies are pretty much all sort of, uh, you know, economic quasi linear entities. Um, but it's something you need to think about in our research. We generally abstract it away. Um, I guess I'll go to Jeff first. So on, on this day, which was the, uh, you know, campus work, just walk out. Uh, <laughs> can you tell me about uh, what is the opportunity for organized labor within the organized framework? Mm, can I tell you that? I don't know if I can tell you that. Um, yeah, I think the, so can anything that we, any of the research we've done sort of help organized labor in some ways? Possibly. So one thing is, Within a group, like an organized labor group, you need to make decisions on behalf of the entire group. And you have to do that somehow. And you, the same conundrum with public projects could come up. So maybe they can have ways to make decisions that are based on research and public projects. Um, in terms of like maybe the matching in the labor market stuff, uh, that seems more challenging. This is a, um, seems like a pretty different paradigm. So I'm not sure. Uh, Rebecca. So I guess there's a <coughs> assumption that like, we don't want to spend money if we don't have to, but what prevents, how does that show up in the math? Like what prevents yeah. a person from just saying, yeah, this is like, this is my preference and I'm going to spend all my money. Yeah. Yeah. So where it shows up is, um, yeah, the value for money is kind of raised against, I'd like to find this picture, um, the value of the thing. <laughs> So it's kind of all in this assumption that this person would rather have $150 than get a kitchenette, but they'd rather have a kitchenette than get $149. So it's kind of all in that assumption. Um, and then there's also this, it's also assumed to be quasi linear, which was mentioned. So they'd rather have like a kitchenette and 50 bucks than have $200 or 199. So that's all kind of baked in there. Yeah, I mean, there is some work in mechanism design with budgeting. So um, you assume you have a budget to spend and you just want to find the maximum value possible subject to the budget. This is completely independent thread from the quadratic voting. Um, because it, that's assuming that it's kind of marginal value. So in the, the quadratic voting stuff I presented um, uses does use this model. 
And the key idea is that every vote you cast kind of costs more because you're paying the square of the votes. And whereas your money, your utility for money is assumed to be kind of the same. So every dollar is the same value to you, but every vote costs more and more dollars. So you kind of stop at a reasonable point. So it is baked in. It's, if no one's going to stop me, I'm going to keep calling on people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm not sure if this is even a well-formed question, but like in terms of your stick figure sort of perspective, right? like there's basically you're saying there's a model and I'm making assumptions about a model, but we're disconnecting the odds. Is there any way to like test other than like uh, analyzing the assumptions? Yeah, like, definitely. So yeah, so you definitely would like to test if the model and the things you're doing are connected to reality. And actually, economists tend to have a very, pretty high level of rigor for this. Whereas in computer science theory, we say, well, I proved a theorem. And the economists will often hold their feet to the fire and say, but, you know, does it look like that? So, yeah, there's definitely, I mean, you can just test things like people's value for money. But you can also say, like, um, like one thing we did is take some historical data and try to run our mechanism on it and see what the outcome would be and at least compare that to what did happen. So you can do that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I think so much of it actually needs to come down to understanding the qualitative values that you have and sort of, it's, it's not even so much about is this realistic, but it's more like, is this capturing the values we want out of the system? I think that discussion is, is so key. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. Sorry for keeping you late, everyone. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you both. Thank you.